Welcome back to SCR Unfiltered. I'm Bill Faith, your host, and I'm excited to talk about today about why unique matters because I see so many of you buying today and you're settling or you're getting impatient. You're not fully underwriting properties appropriately and you're buying like it's 2021 where you can just go buy anything that you want and it's going to work. Well, it's not. I'm going to tell you that. So I want to kind of walk you through Every one of the properties that I own, with the exception of one, has something unique that most people as investors are not gonna be able to replicate. And the, the one property that is not unique, it's actually a beachfront property and it performs very well. It's in Fort Morgan, Alabama, but, and it's designed well by my wife. Everything is great about it, but there's just 700 of them in that market. So it has made it more challenging to be able to, to rent at premium rates. So I'm still getting about 15, 20% above market, and I'm still outperforming the 90th percentile by about 25, 27%, but I'm not hitting above 50%. So for me, that means I need to look at repositioning that property also because I have about $900,000 in equity in that property. Every other property I have that I own in my portfolio is extremely unique. And I'm getting ready to buy a new property here. I'm actually leaving in about six days, five days actually, uh, to go back to Montana. Haven't been there forever, it seems like, since early May when I had my fly fishing retreat there. And I'm buying a super unique property. It's six acres. It has a main house that's four bedrooms with a loft that I can use as a fifth bedroom. It's a very modern Montana cabin uh, built in 2019, so very, very new. Uh, it has a guest house. It's really two houses. I probably won't even refer to it as a guest house. It is a full two bedroom, a two en suites, full kitchen, large family room, three car garage. And then right in between main house, master house, is about a 150, 60 foot man-made uh, creek that ascends down into basically a one acre pond, a lake, which is cool with a nice Trex deck and a fire pit on it. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And that's something that I have not seen anywhere in that area, and it is right in between Whitefish and Kalispell, super close to the airport, 15 minutes to the ski resort, five minutes to downtown Whitefish, five minutes to downtown Kalispell. It's a prime location, but it's unique that does not exist in that market. If you've seen my other property that I have there that's on the river with the incredible views and everything, it's unique that does not exist in that market. But even though those two properties are unique, the property that I have previously on the river, I've added the hot tub, I've added a, a barrel sauna, nobody has a barrel sauna in that market. I've added a geodome as recently as the beginning of June, nobody has a geodome. So I'm literally making investments into things that people don't have to do one of two things, either to extend occupancy, increase occupancy, or to increase ADR, and it doesn't always have to be both. But I also, when I'm underwriting these properties, I see that I have the land to be able to do that. So one of the things about this new property I'm closing on, one, it will be the biggest single family home purchase uh, that I've ever made. It's gonna $2.95 million. Uh, and it has enough room on the property and it's already cleared out. It's got a pad to where I can build a 3,750 square foot learning center to where I can host boot camps there, I can host retreats there, and when by the time I get done doing some upgrades and renovation to the property, I'll be able to sleep somewhere between 26 to 35 people on property as well. So those are the things that I'm looking at as the value add. So that's the thing about the space and the location and the pond and the creek and the two houses and the pad and all that type of stuff that makes this property unique. The other property in Montana is the river and the access and the views and all those things that can't be replicated. We just bought on the perfect space where the river turns and we can see the lake and we can see the Canadian Rockies. The condo that I own, it's three miles from Glacier National Park and it's all zoned scenic corridor. So no new residential construction is gonna happen between us and the entrance to Glacier National Park. It's also extremely luxurious, meaning the builder that built it is incredible. So it's got this next level um, that you can't find in that market and won't be replicated as well. Uh, Dragonfly, my number one beachfront property in Gulf Shores, Alabama, has four open lots in front of it. The exact same house from the exact same builder, just designed a little bit differently, also has a pool, 12 houses down, does about 185 to 200 with a property management company. 
I do about 330 to 350 through my property because I market it as almost beachfront because I have open lots in front of me. Good friend of mine that started as a co-hosting client, still a co-hosting client, but turned into a good friend, has a house two doors down. He's in front of those four lots as well. Five, three and a half, much older than mine, still has a pool, you know, still crushing his at about 240, 250 uh, a year as well. Unique, Banner Elk property. You, at the, If you're at my conference, you saw I introduced you, I just closed on a, a small five bedroom uh, right in the heart of Banner Elk. Well, there was only three competitors that could walk to downtown Banner Elk and they were all shit properties. So we turned in, we made a great property, a super property, and we don't even have a hot tub yet. We're still dealing with the city to try to get our deck uh, extended so we can add a hot tub and we're still crushing the numbers uh, that I had anticipated when we purchased the house. The second Banner Elk property sits at the top of a mountain, 30 mile long range views, two acres that nobody has. I have an acre and a half, literally a backyard and grass. I have a guest house. I have a, two garages. So I had a three car garage underneath the guest house that I turned in to a game room. So all of these things that create the uniqueness in my properties when I invest in the lake, um, I'm heading down to the lake today. Uh, the first property that I bought there was okay. Didn't, uh, those really early back in uh, 2019, 2020, didn't know then what I don't now, did pretty well, got some great appreciation. But then when I bought the second property, uh, bought in my buy zone, that six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollar range, uh, paid seven ninety nine, put one hundred twenty five into it, built, turned it into a super property, five three and a half, but it's right in the heart of the lake with the longest range views, flat lot to where I can put putting green, mod pool, fire put, fire pit, all that type of stuff, which is hard to find on that lake, unique things that God built that I, other people can't come and replace. The new property that I just got done there turned a 7.6 into a 12.9 that sleeps 38 people with two game rooms, two massive, you know, bonus rooms that we turned into queen private kind of bunk suite rooms, no bunk beds in this entire property uh, to sleep 38 people, two kitchens, um, all this type of stuff and plenty of seating for dining and all those things, parking for up to 16 vehicles does not exist on that lake. That's why I chose that lake to do this property and we're already getting $2,500, $2,700 a night rates booking for next spring uh, and next summer already. So I can't emphasize enough that the uniqueness and not, when I say unique, I'm not talking about wall murals, murals, I'm not talking about interior design, no disrespect to any designers out there, whether it's a Sheeta or a Paige or my wife or whoever, you know, their designs are great and they help, they add value, but that is not what turns something into a super property. And if you are gonna try to focus on design, you sure as hell better make sure you manage your budget right? Because too many of you are over-designing. You're buying $700,000 properties and putting in $250,000 interior designs. That is absolutely freaking ridiculous to me if you're making a financially driven investment. This 7.6 that I just turned into an amazing 12.9 super property. I should say Bria did it. We literally spent $425,000. That includes building out the entire basement, adding kitchens, adding, we added four bathrooms, uh, flooring, roof, exterior paint, all this type of stuff. And some of you guys are spending like almost half or more than that just on interior design. That is not very smart. You are not gonna get a return on investment. Remember, building a super property is literally maximizing your return on investment. You're doing something that nobody else in the market's doing, right? So you have to be extremely calculated in where you're sourcing, where you're buying, what you're paying, because there is a threshold and you don't ever wanna go above that threshold. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. I think Ashida does the best designs in our industry. But what I can tell you is I've had many of my members, mastermind, inner circle, just within the group that have used her and other expensive designers and they're not getting the returns that we get because we go to this threshold. That's why we talk about doing restoration hardware design on a home goods budget. There's a lot of things that just don't move the needle and those are things that you need to eliminate when you're trying to build out a super property to max out your returns. And it all starts in where you're buying and how you're buying. So one of the things I want you guys to understand is you never buy a market, you're buying a property. And the very first thing before you even start looking is you need to set your budget. Because if you don't set your budget, if you don't set how much cash you're gonna invest in total and you don't set your, your buying price and then you don't get pre-qualified, in that market, then, you know, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time, you know, researching markets when you really get into that buying zone? If you're not in the buying zone, you should still be researching at least three days a week. I research at least four to five days a week. I underwrite with the good, better, best performers. That's three performers written per property 
at least five to seven homes every single week, even if I am not in buying mode. I'm 100% not in buying mode right now because I'm getting ready to close on a $3 million property. But I am still looking and I'm still underwriting. That way, if I find a sweet deal, I may pull the trigger on it. But if I don't, then I'm going to pass it on to my inner circle or my mastermind so somebody in those groups can take advantage of it as well. But I'm, most importantly, I'm practicing, I'm practicing, I'm practicing. I don't want to get out of practice. If any of you have ever done anything, if you tried to you know, get healthy or lose weight like I have over the last year, you've got to be consistent every single day. If you've tried to excel in a sport or in business, you have to excel at your skill sets and you have to practice them every single day. Practice, practice, practice. So same thing, I want you to keep underwriting and practicing. So set your budget first, write it down, share it with your spouse, do a public proclamation with your accountability group or your friends or whoever it is. So that way they can help hold you accountable. Number two is then you start identifying uh, the markets, right? And the first place that I go to is STR Insights. It's the easiest tool that I've found. Um, STR IQ, if you haven't seen that, if they're available in your market, I would check out STR IQ as well. Both of those are way easier than AirDNA to identify uh, values. And actually, STR IQ only shows you what's available on the MLS right now, which is pretty cool. And they already have your performance ran for you. The second thing, once you do that, is you start underwriting that market. You need at least 10 comps. So if you're looking at two bedroom, two baths, I do probably closer to 12 to 13 comps. I'm going to run at least five to six in my bedroom count. Then I'm going to run at least three on the other bedroom count. So I could be running about 13, 14, 15 properties because I'm always planning on off season. I'm going to have to compete down below peak season. I'm trying to ascend and compete above, right? And those are things that a lot of people don't tell you. They just say, oh, look at your bedroom count and go, go and, and do that. I mean, if you're buying a five bedroom house, you're actually going to compete with three bedrooms and four bedrooms during the off season. So you need to have that as part of your underwriting process. Uh, before you decide to hone in on a property and a specific bedroom count. So uh, that also gives me the ability to look at minimum one bedroom count down, one bedroom count up. So that way I can identify the volume and also the competitiveness inside of three bedroom counts. Let's just use three, four, and five bedrooms so I know what's below and I know what's up. Because look, a lot of people are buying three bedrooms, four bedrooms in the Smokies. I will never invest into that market. Um, I said probably will never invest in that market. But if I did, I'm going to do two bedrooms or one bedrooms, or I'm going to go probably six and above. I'm staying away from three, four, and five bedrooms in the Smokies because I've done the underwriting. I do the research, and those just do not fit into what I look at as sound investment. So I'm going smaller or I'm going bigger. And in many markets, you will see the exact same thing because the herd floods right into the middle. I know you guys are going to have a million questions. I try to keep my podcast short and concise. So if you do have questions, leave a comment down below. If I provided even one ounce of value for you, make sure you hit that subscribe button, whether you're listening on the podcast or watching on YouTube. I'll see you guys on the next episode of STR Unfiltered.